Hello and welcome to Monk's Jazz and a very special presentation evening from Austin Jazz Society and Off the Bandstand Live. My name is Christian Wiggs. I will be your host this evening. Again, this is what an incredible opportunity to honor and celebrate and induct two substantial names in the Austin Jazz community into the Austin Jazz Society Hall of Fame, both Alex Koch and Rich Harney. We have a whole evening planned of presentations and segments to talk about, some conversation and some music. But for now, well actually, before we get into it, we want to make sure to thank our special sponsors who have made this evening possible. A uh, special thank you to Michael Dodson, Mary Dye, Lemuel Johnson, David Lobb, Yolanda Delgado, Stanley and Mary Jane, Sykin, Tom and Barbara Van Tassel, and the Austin Jazz Society. Ladies and gentlemen, the Alex Koch Quartet.
That was by Abdullah Ibrahim, entitled uh, Bombella. We'll continue with the tune of Rich Harney's entitled Parlez-vous.
My name's Alex Koch, and we'd like to thank you. Thanks for being here. What a thrill. Huh? We're going to continue with another one of Rich's tunes. This is entitled Mama Bear.
One more time for Alex Koch, ladies and gentlemen, and the Alex Koch Quartet. Alex, how are you, my friend? Seems to be nice, huh? Nice evening. It, it, well, it seems to be. I, th I think people are having a good time. I hope so. Okay. There we go. <laughs> okay. It's like, yeah, no, 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 just stop, stop. Don't, don't keep... You know. No, uh, Alex. You know this is this is such an incredible night that we're we're here to to celebrate with you. How do you? Is there any sort of feeling that you have that is overwhelming, or or any variety of feelings? Kind of having this great honor of being in the Hall of Fame. I think fantastic to be indicted into the Hall of Fame here in Austin. <laughs> indicted. I think I think Tom Van Tassel wrote that joke, and he just yeah. slid it right in there. Thanks, Tom. Uh, I would also be remiss, I, one person that I left out who is also a sponsor of this evening that I have to recognize as someone who's in the house with us tonight, Mr. Clay Robinson, a sponsor of this evening. Yeah, so uh, one of the, the projects that people are going to uh, be very familiar with uh, here very soon is uh, the conversations that Rabbi Neil, Neil Blumoff did with all of the uh, Hall of Fame uh, recipients. And, and as someone who has been close to those projects, I've been able to go back and, and rewatch them. And it's such a, a pleasure and a privilege. But one of the things that you uh, remarked in there was that uh, you always leave Austin, but you always come back. And it seems like the work was always really plentiful for you, I mean, kind of from the get-go of coming back from, uh, what was it, Boulder? Uh, you were in Boulder for doing your undergrad? Boulder, right, that's right. And then Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C., yeah. For a while, yeah. and then Paris for a moment, and Spain, and but always coming back to Austin. Always coming back and forth. Yeah, it seems that you took the proverbial wise man's uh, advice to the gambler, and you, you just left the table while everything was hot, and you went over to all these other scenes. Uh, and I was curious, as someone who has seen not only several countries, but also several continents, uh, what kept you loosely tethered to Austin all this time? Rich. Family, yeah. you know? Rich is, you know, he's... We met in about 1975, so I don't know. I don't feel like I'm 45 years old, but I knew him that long. I mean, we really played together. Yeah, so. absolutely. Can you uh, tell us just a little bit about uh, the the kind of collaboration and when you when you met Rich and how that kind of, as I understand it, very quickly blossomed into this beautiful partnership and, and collaborative friendship? Yeah, I was I was here from uh, University of Colorado at Boulder, and mm -hmm. I was staying with a friend of mine. Uh, Stone Savage, who was a bass player, who's mm -hmm. now running kind of a wine shop jazz club in Dallas. Okay. And um, I was sleeping on the floor in there, and then I woke up. I smelled some coffee. I went in the kitchen, and there was Rich. We poured a cup of coffee. There was a piano in the next room, and we started playing. We're just like that, really. And never stopped. You can't, you can't write a better like Hollywood picture than that for, for, for Lifelong Prince. Kind of going back, I, I would love to talk to you about, you know, uh, something else that I interpreted was that Picking the flute, I'm sure there were other reasons, but a lot of it maybe just had to do with the fact that you could carry it around with you wherever you went? That's exactly right. I was in uh, fourth grade, and back then in the Texas schools, you could, you know, they gave you a choice to take art, choir, drama, and band. Mm. So we did that for a year and uh, to see which one we liked the most, and then you would continue that. So my best friend was in the band, and, and uh, I said, what are you going to play? What are you going to take? Because I was thinking, well, clarinet, saxophone, I don't know. He mm. flute. I'm going, flute? Why are you going to take flute? Because <laughs> it's small, and we can just put it in the locker. It'll be real easy to carry. And it's true. I mean, compared to carrying a harp around, a flute is pretty easy. Or drums or a bass, you know. Even all those pedals, you know. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It all starts to add, you know, it all yeah. starts to add, you know, and, and choosing the, you know, unpredictable path and, and sometimes tumultuous path of being not only a musician, but a jazz musician, you know, uh, often implies that the bond, not only between you, uh, a, a musician and, and their instrument, but themselves and the music is just too great for them to divert anything less than their full efforts and uh, full attention. And so I'm curious, what has the music meant to you throughout your career, different points in your career, whether you were, you know, in your 20s, 30s, uh, 40s, how has the music uh, kind of impacted you on a philosophical, emotional, spiritual, mental, physical, in all of these different planes, what does the music mean to you? 
We, that's about 100% on every one of those. Yeah. I mean, we, we have a family here and uh, around the world. I have people I haven't played with for now several years, and you get mm. together and you're playing, and it's just fantastic where you drop. It's like a family. It really is. And, uh, and also, it's such an incredible heritage to be part of uh, uh, jazz uh, heritage and to have, be able to play or, or meet people and, and be part of that, you know, when... Uh, you know, people, you'd say you're from Texas, people would know of Tony Campisi, they would mm. know of uh, Tina Marsh, and, uh, you know, the people are, are well known, and, and we get around, I mean, somebody was saying, oh, Bruce Saunders is down there? Man, you lucky dogs. <laughs> really, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Someone who I, I dearly admire uh, gave the advice to young cats who were just coming on the scene saying that, you know, it, they're like, oh, what would you give advice to young people who are trying to make it, and he just said that you have to want it more than anyone else in the room, more than anyone else in the city, more than anyone else that you could possibly know. You just have to want it that badly. And it seems like through all of the different stories that I've heard, you have been just a constant st student, just constantly been involved in that studentship uh, throughout every decade of your career. And uh, even going so far as to, you know, very, in a crafty kind of way, it seems like you were able to be a part of the UT Jazz Band legacy without paying that dang tuition. That was true. Thanks to Bob Meyer. Now he's, they, they can't go after him now. <laughs> uh, and also a real Hall of Famer, right? Sure, I mean, yeah, I was absolutely. really lucky to be around a lot of these people. And, uh, and uh, I was moving to Washington, D.C. I knew I was going. And I didn't have good eyes to read. I mean, still, they're <laughs> a problem. But I was trying to get better at my reading. So I went down to the ACC. I got in the big band there. And then I went over to Bob. And I said, hey, Bob, um, do you need a tenor player? I'll show up and recite read. I really need to. Sure. I don't know why, but at that time, there was an, they were lacking one tenor player. And he goes, well, you can do it if you show up. I made more uh, attendance than anybody else in the band, I think. <laughs> But uh, yeah, he, it was amazing, amazingly helpful, Bob. I did the same thing in, in Washington, D.C. at UDC under Calvin Jones, mm. the trombonist up there. Yeah, talking about there must be something in, in Woods players about uh, being places early and being places, you know, uh, constantly being there for attendance. Because I've also heard stories of Tony Campisi just getting to a gig maybe four hours early just to get that perfect parking spot. And then just so there's something in the water for Woods players that just makes uh, uh, being prompt uh, a priority. Well, Tony was special, too, because he, he would play a room. I mean, the sound that Tony would would play the saxophone, but he was playing the room. I mean, the sound of the room, when you heard the mm. room, it was, and you'd hear him in a different room, and it would be a little different. I mean, mm. he was really a, a special guy, and, and especially the bass flute. I mean, yeah, he course. was, and such a kind, sweet man, too. Yeah. And beautiful that we get to keep that tradition going of that bass flute with, with Chris Kimura over at uh, over at Parker playing that I instrument. I would have brought there. mine, but she didn't want to go out during the pandemic. Yeah, fair enough, yeah. fair enough. Well, and I know that you've spent a considerable amount of time playing outside of the States, and I'm curious, you know, what were some of the unique characteristics uh, that drew you to the scene in spots like Europe and the Netherlands? Uh, what, were you, what was unique about those places as opposed to, to Austin? Uh, well, it's, it's incredibly different. I, I, I was going to the Netherlands probably since 1976 was the first time I went there on, with a backpack and a, and a flute. Mm. you know, traveling around. And I just really liked the people. And, and plus, I was always gravitated towards an, an, being an expat. A lot of my friends in D.C., I mean, the people that were there when I was there were people like Paul Ballenbeck on guitar, mm. or Frank Kimbrough, or Lyles West. Well, they wanted, they all wanted to go to New York, and they did, Ed Howard, you know, for example. And uh, I did not want to go to New York. Mm. I, I wanted to go to Europe. Um, Anyway, so I did. I mean, you, you just, people go, how'd you get there? You, you just buy a ticket and yeah. you rough it, you know? Yeah. But, uh. Absolutely. It seems like, uh, yeah, I, I'd said this earlier, but it seems like the the fears of travel to, to pack up your life and go to a completely different place never seem to follow you. I mean, whenever we look at all those different places of Colorado, back to Austin, D.C., Paris, Netherlands, I believe you did some projects over in Africa at one point as well. I've got too. a record called the Harmatin, which is over there for sale, along with a bunch of stuff. And it uh, is over there for sale. Yeah. Everybody take note. And it's a, it's a, it's a very interesting project because we're, we're uh, 
Accra. I did it with Steve Feld, who wrote a book called Cosmopolitanism in mm. Accra, because we always think of, you know, what do you think of when you think of uh, Accra, and what do you think of when you think of African jazz, or, you know, and th but these guys, they met Steve, and they go, oh, you're from Philadelphia, John Coltrane. They knew immediately, mm. and they were totally into Coltrane, so they did Coltrane free tunes, and on African put together instruments, uh, the craziest drum set you know you could imagine I mm. mean it's an amazing thing and it's it's definitely you know it's, you're, it's part of the avant-garde it's part of the tradition but yet it's them playing it it's it's I don't think it's anything really that you've heard too much like in a sure way. yeah fantastic well everybody will have to grab a copy and <laughs> then uh, partake in in a in a listening party maybe we'll have another one here over at monks but uh, for now we want to uh, you know honor you and, and uh, one of the reasons that we are here one of these two main reasons we are here is to present you uh, with uh, the award of being inducted into the Austin Jazz Society Hall of Fame so ladies and gentlemen if you could please welcome up the director uh, committee chair of the Hall of Fame Austin Jazz Society uh, committee mr. Clark Nesbitt I'm uh, Clark Nisbet. I'm uh, part of the board of directors of Austin Jazz Society, and each year we induct uh, members into the Hall of Fame. Um, members that are inducted are people that have made significant contributions um, to jazz in Austin and in the greater community uh, all over the world, in the case of Alex. And um, uh, there are several criteria associated with this that are not just associated with one's musicianship, but uh, one's ability to collaborate with other musicians and helping out and tutoring uh, young uh, jazz artists as they come up and contributing just to the medium of jazz. And um, Alex certainly fits a bill in all of this stuff and we're very proud and honored to induct Mr. Alex Cope. Well, thank you, Clark. Thank you. to the, uh, the spokesman here. Fantastic. All right. Well, Alex, I, I think you have some more of Rich's uh, tunes coming up, right? We do indeed. Fantastic. We do Ladies indeed. and gentlemen, Alex Cope. I would, would like to mention that we have Rich's books in PDF form format, and we're trying to disseminate these, this music, so I, I don't feel sometimes I'm the only one playing it. I think they're really great tunes. Uh, to me, they sound like standards, and people, when we've played them in Europe and we've taken them, people go, who wrote that? That sounds like, you know, Horace Silver, or that sounds like... And so I, I wish, you know, that they eventually would have gotten around to we're saying, that sounds like Rich Harney. Uh, because it does to me, and uh, but but there is a lot of this music that's published and available, um, and we're going to take some orders, and hopefully we're going to uh, do a Rich Arney Jazz Festival at the First Presbyterian. So a lot of sales from the records, uh, and and these books will go towards that. And he's got a scholarship. Maria has a scholarship set up for him, and uh, I mean really, there's the he 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 lives on in spirit and music and. So if you have any questions about that or want to get on any kind of list, uh, Nikki is over there. <laughs> and now it's uh, amazing, and and it's not his first go round. I mean, when I came back the last time, it, he was having these pop up concerts everywhere, and bicycle shops and coffee shops, and really keeping the jazz alive in a way uh, that it needs. It all, it needs support. Otherwise, uh, we just go back underground or move to Europe. I don't know. Oh, uh, we're gonna continue. This is a beautiful tune Rich wrote, and, and uh, we didn't talk about his poetry, but uh, he wrote a while back, and 
this was one of the hardest gigs I ever had to put music for together. I mean, I started thinking of one tune, I think of five more. Mm -hmm. The piano was covered with music. The chairs got covered with music. Every music stand in the place was covered with music. It started being on the floor, piles, the whole kitchen counters. It was, uh, and, the, and the band, really, they're really quite wonderful because, you know, when we got the gig and said, what are we going to play? There were probably about 150 tunes, you know, and Masumi, well, we're not going to have time for all those, <laughs> but, but we'll do what we can.
Thank you. That was called Now and Then. And uh, he wrote that along with Beth Ullman many years ago. This is another tune that, that we've played for many years. He, he played this in all sorts of formations, and it's one he wrote for Herbie Hancock, who is just in town. So it's called One for Herbie.
The Alex Cope Quartet. Well, if you are tuning in to the live stream this evening, uh, right above my head, just right about there, it's always funny whenever it's a mirror image, uh, are links to uh, donate to Austin Jazz Society's Project Safety Net. Uh, I personally can attest to uh, the good that Austin Jazz Society has done for myself and countless other jazz musicians over the course of uh, the past year and a half, I guess it is now, uh, where they have just been able to uh, provide some... Um, you know, a safety net, a, a project safety net and, and uh, financial security and just a little bit of help towards a lot of musicians. And they've been able to fundraise so much that goes directly back into the community. And so I can't think of a, uh, a better way to, uh, you know, donate to 
music in Austin than uh, these folks over at Austin Jazz Society. So we thank them very much. Yeah, let's give them a hand. Yes. I would like to uh, just throw out there, if anybody would donate $50 or more, and you would like, we'll give you a copy of Soul Prayers that Rich and I did. Fantastic. There for, it is. Uh, for a premium, yeah. right? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Let's do that. You know, so it, one of the things that is really special about hearing, you know, you said it was one of the hardest things is trying to curate this concert because there's just so much music to pick. But I think hearing so many of Rich's compositions um, is, is really special and, and it just goes to show the lasting impact and the legacy that his music uh, has had is having and will have on the, Ast or the Austin jazz community uh, just for years to come, and, and greater than that as well. I mean, it's really uh, stretching far beyond. I'm, I'm curious, you know, whenever you picked certain songs, was there any uh, rhyme or reason other than it just being his compositions that you picked the compositions that he did? Because I know he wrote so many all the time. Well, I was very excited, you know, so I ended up picking like a lot of flag wavers. I mean, I call them, you know, kind of exciting tunes, and I, I really, they were always thrilling to play with him, and, uh, and you just got your blood going, and, and, uh, and then I had too many of those. I had about 30 or 40, and I had to call them down, and then I thought, well, a ballad. We need a ballad. And, uh, and also, he wrote so many beautiful flute waltzes. I mean, he would bring a, 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 a waltz, and he goes, why don't you play flute on this? You know, and there's certain things that after many years, like in that one for Herbie, I do these kind of false fingering trills on some of the tunes. He wrote those in, and he kind of almost expected to hear them uh -huh. when I played it. And so I had so many memories like that, uh, you know, and I would look at one tune. Oh, that's a great one. I mean, the, of waltzes, there, I could do a whole night of those. We could do a week of those. Yeah. Really, every night we could do a, we could do a week of, of his beautiful waltzes that he wrote. Yeah, how quickly, uh, with you knowing him, because I know it was just over a cup of coffee and then it was off to the races, uh, <laughs> but you know, how quickly did you notice all those compositions just kind of flooding out of his, his creative mind? Was it all right from the beginning, or did you notice kind of an increase over, over your collaboration? Well, when we met, I mean, we were still fairly young, and we didn't know a lot of jazz tunes. I, I had a real book. And so we had a gig, and we'd read these tunes, and we'd learn together, and we'd go, we'd do the gig in the afternoon. We had a lunch gig, and we'd have that'd be our breakfast, and then we'd go home and we'd practice and we'd read tunes. But when I met Rich, he had a lot of tunes already. He was already, I mean, mostly he had original tunes, and that's what really drew me towards him, you know. And but they were jazz oriented, they were blues tunes. He had some pop tunes. I mean, when I met him, he he had already had a. a I don't know where all those tunes are now. I'm, sure, know. sure. Yeah. He did not discriminate between styles. It was just going to be kind of anything that came to his mind, he was going to he was going to make it happen. Yeah, in the beginning, yeah, absolutely. And he gravitated more towards jazz. Sure. I mean, yeah. So with you kind of uh, hopping in and out of Austin, uh, I assume that Rich had stayed put for the most part. Is that is that safe to say? Or, or he probably j just in the sense he didn't come with you to all these different other places. Right. Yeah. I mean, early on, he, he got a couple of months playing in Beirut. He was mm -hmm. playing in a hotel there. And so, you know, we'd, and he'd come back and he'd man, check this out. And then I'd go to some place and I'd come back. I'd go, hey, check this out. So we were always like, going away, gathering more information to bring sure. back to show each other, you know. We were just ex traveling, you know, just being someplace new made me, I can't wait to show this to Rich, you know, yeah. or when you bring gifts back to your friends and stuff. Yeah, was it one of those things where, you know, uh, you don't see someone for several years and then you see somebody and it feels like five minutes had passed or just like you guys went home, slept, got a good night's sleep, and came back like zero time had passed. Was that how it felt every time you came back to Austin? Oh, yeah. I mean, but it was rarely several years in between. I don't mm -hmm. think it was ever more than a year in between. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Because very, I'd very come special. back for Christmas or something, you know, stuff like that. Sure, yeah, absolutely. You know, and, and for those of us who didn't know him personally, I mean, I think I had a couple phone calls with him, uh, but it was more, more in passing of like, you know, 
hi, Rich, I got your number from somebody, and they said, who's the best person to come tune a piano? And, and actually, he said, Colin Shook. He said, Colin Shook is the guy. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, it all, it all ties together. It all comes together. Yeah. Um, you know, for those, uh, those of us who, who didn't know him personally, you know, and because you were so close to him um, in such an artistically intimate way, uh, how would you describe his, his approach uh, to playing and composing? Oh, it's 100%. I mean, when we lived together at one point, he lived next door. There was a door between our kitchens that had been nailed shut, but then we unnailed it. And, <laughs> and, uh, and we'd wake up, I'd wake up hearing Hannon, and then I'd try to set the alarm to wake up before him and start practicing before <laughs> him, you know, which I did once or twice. But, but mainly, he was up, and you'd hear it, you know, it was going, and, yeah. and all the way till we just fell asleep at night. I yeah. mean, that, and back in Austin, you know, then in Austin, you could really do that. It was really quite affordable. Sure, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and so you, you lived together for, for how long? Oh, on and off at different times, but a uh, couple of years here and there. And, yeah. And, uh, I mean, he usually had his own place. And sure. But at that time, we were in a group house, and then there was, uh, you know, now and again. Yeah, yeah. Beautiful, beautiful. You know, one of the specific pieces that I wanted to uh, talk about was the Dylan Thomas uh, prose piece uh, that's uh, A Child's Christmas in Wales. And I was listening back to that and, and just thought, man, people who have the idea to set this, you know, an adaptation to music are my kind of people who really just see kind of the value in, in beautifully written uh, text. I mean, myself being a vocalist is, you know, text is everything. And, and, you know, you hear songs that lyrics, you know, might have just been like, here's a good rhyme scheme and I'm gonna put this together. But, you know, even as expressed by before uh, the audience had come in, you know, you were reading me the lyrics to Now and Then, right? right? And just breathtaking beautiful i mean so so not only with his uh lyrics that he wrote but just ones that he sought out uh kind of tell me what was the impetus for that specific piece of prose uh, and setting that to music well i i uh, have my friend oliver franklin used to be curator at uh, harry ransom center mm. and so we were doing little shows you know like for beatnik poetry or they have poetry on the plaza for okay. example so we were playing some of those and and we wanted to do a christmas one he goes i want you to do a christmas thing so i thought about it i talked to Susie stern and i said let's do a christmas thing but not christmas tunes or mm. you know hanukkah tunes or you know let's let's do and she brought it up and she said dylan thomas i used to read that to my children mm. every christmas or and my mother read it to me so that was it, and it started out as free, pretty much free improvisation, mm. and and we each brought a couple of little tunes to it, and it grew over the I don't know eight or nine years that we did it. I don't know how many years it was, but we would always add something. I added a little toy symphony, which I always I'm sorry yeah. it's not on the record, but I mean that piece was a living piece, and it was so much fun every year to go somewhere and do it. You yeah, know. yeah, that's beautiful, and that was over at a place that that Rich was kind of the the tenured pianist over at, I, I understand, was First Presbyterian? We did it at First Presbyterian a couple of times. We, we played it all over town. And one, the, 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 we actually did it at Central Market, which was not our strongest, you know, it was a little <laughs> diffuse. Sure. But, uh, but it was uh, an eclectic audience. You yeah. Know. First Presbyterian was great. I mean, it's, you know, the kids are just wrapped because it's mostly toy. I have a lot of toys to mm -hmm. play. And I finally made a table that had like 24 different sound effects on it. Oh, throughout beautiful. the thing and we had a script and read it and I, reg I can't imagine ever doing it without Rich I yeah. mean, we, we really it was Chris Marsh was on the, the record mm. and uh, with Susie and Rich so it was a quartet but, well we have that where we can we can go back and listen to it right because you said you have a record of that specific we do and I can brag about this record in that the cover one and Addy when you open it up it's a 3D pop up oh <laughs> and fantastic. so you can put it up you know, on the mantelpiece. Like, because we always grew up, you know, at Christmas, yeah, sure. we had something on the mantel with s fake snow and stuff. And, yeah. And so this was sort of designed to look like that. And it's the whole, in it's a story. Like, if you, there's the throwing snowballs at the cat, mm. and yeah. there's a little wheel that you can spin inside with the cat running around. Yeah. Sure. Snowballs coming at it. Specifically with that one, and I guess this can be an overarching question about a, a lot of the collaborations that you did, was it mostly Rich composing and him kind of writing stuff with you in mind, or did you both kind of toss around compositional ideas to each other? Well, it was a lot of Susie's tunes on there, really? actually, okay. too, yeah, because she knew the story so well. 
Mm. And uh, so it, I think in the beginning, Susie had a couple, and then we went, and then Rich goes, well, I'll write one too. Yeah. So these things got added on and on as we, as we did it year after year. Yeah. So, so the record is like round one. But it's still, it's still a very, it's just such a lovely story. Yeah, absolutely. Beautiful. Well, speaking of Rich and, and all of this, you know, legacy that, that both you and he share, uh, I think it's time to welcome Clark back up to present the second induction. Uh, so please welcome Clark Nisbet. Thank you so much. Uh, if Maria Thompson would come up here, uh, we'd like to present the, the award to her. Let's well, give a hand I, to Maria I, I, Thompson. I'm told that our adoring online audience is this away. So uh, we're kind of be, going to be pointed this way. Um, just from a personal standpoint, uh, I've heard that had the joy and pleasure of hearing a rich play all around town, as well as for uh, Austin Jazz Society events and uh, Jazz at St. James events, um, and enjoyed it tremendously. And uh, he's certainly a guy we're so happy and, and proud to induct into the Hall of Fame, and we would like for you to have this plaque. <laughs> Would you like to say something? That's enough. Okay, well, thank you so much. All right, well, let's get back to the music. And uh, Alex, what do you have coming up next? Um, we're going to play uh, uh, one of these waltzes by Rich. It's called right. Maria's Garden. Appropriately. Alex, is there oh. a place for this? I don't think we need it. I thought we would quit at 9.30, but that's nine o'clock. Okay. We did have enough music. More than enough. <laughs> we got about 120 <laughs> tunes in the, in the back. Put down, there's just as many.
do. Shall we? Yeah. This is a blues Rich wrote. He loved the blues. Uh, when I met him, we'd go to gigs and go in the car, you know, so we'd travel for hours and we'd make mixtapes for each other to listen to. And he loved Oscar Peterson, Cedar Walton, and McCoy Diner and Bill Evans. Anyway, uh, this is a blues he wrote called Blues Rue. Thank you. 
Ladies and gentlemen, Masumi Jones on the drums, Michael Stevens on the double bass, Bruce Saunders on the guitar, and Alex Koch on the saxophone and flute. If you like what you hear, you can catch streams three or four times a week here at Monk's Jazz. Subscribe to the YouTube and Facebook page. And please, if you can, uh, donate to Austin Jazz Society's Project Safety Net. Thank you for being here online and in person for such a special evening celebrating Rich Harney and Alex Koch. Please drive safe and have a great evening.